Spencer, what's up, man? It's good to see you again. Thank you for coming on with me tonight. Thanks for having me, man. I uh, love coming on. It's always a, a wonderful time. Every time yeah, I always have talking. a good time talking. I always like hearing your perspective on things. And like, do you look at you look at things from different perspectives that either haven't experienced, don't really have the wherewithal to uh, seek out myself. So I like hearing the different sides of things that you bring to the table. But just so this can be like a standalone episode, would you introduce yourself and uh, some of your experience and why I think you're interested to talk to? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, my name is Spencer Karam. I served eight and a half years in the Marine Corps. I deployed four times. I did three combat tours, once to Iraq, twice to Afghanistan. Uh, and then I did a nice vacation to Cuba for a few months. That was fantastic. Um, and so, yeah, I've, I've got a bit of experience overseas. And I have a really, <clears throat> happen to have a unique uh, perspective on the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan uh, on my second tour, uh, which was my first one to Afghanistan. It was extremely uh, kinetic. And then in my third tour, just uh, six or seven months later, uh, I was <clears throat> essentially the, the, the cool, angry looking guy with the dark sunglasses looking mean in the corner during meetings, uh, acting as a security guard, essentially. Uh, for uh, all the different branches of the U.S. military, as well as 17 NATO nations, uh, and then Afghan National Army, Afghan National Police. Uh, so um, <clears throat> all in Kabul, Afghanistan. So I was able to kind of, I just went from being in an environment where my buddies and I were in the direct line of danger uh, to not so much in the direct line of danger anymore, but understanding i was a part of a command called regional support command capital which was based in kabul uh and they were handling a lot of the construction effort uh throughout kabul and the surrounding areas um and so there's a lot of money exchanging hands tens of millions of dollars uh for each meeting in a lot of cases um <clears throat> and i i had nothing to do with them i just was again the cool guy in the corner with the dark sunglasses looking mean the fly on the wall guy uh, so I just got to listen to what was going on. And every once in a while, I would, you know, uh, after I got friendly with a few of the officers that would go to these meetings that I would be providing protection for uh, on the ride back to base or wherever we're going next, I would, you know, sometimes just ask them, hey, sir, you know, what was, what was this about? Or what was that about? Or why did we give them this much, you know, or why did we give them any money at all? Uh, just be, and, and after starting to see that scope of things, um, and then coming from the environment that I just had, I really started to question the war effort, uh, and the purpose behind it and the, the ability to actually complete the mission that we were told we were trying to complete. And then in 2019, the Afghanistan papers came out, which is a 117 page document, uh, from a bunch of high ranking officers throughout the mil U S military uh, as well as politicians, and I believe an ambassador or two. I might be wrong on that. But anyway, a bunch of people that are in the place to know uh, wrote a bunch of letters, and then they compiled them all into a 117-page document called the Afghanistan Papers. It's Googleable, Duck Duck Goable. Okay, it got published in 2019, but it basically breaks down Afghanistan as a big money bank, uh, much like Iraq was. Uh, and like the main reason we stuck with Iraq for so long, like, yeah, we got involved in Iraq for poor, a lot of poor reasons. There's a lot of conspiracy around that. You know, it was for oil or war or, you know, minerals or whatever. Um, personal opinion, I think it was Dick Cheney acting quarterback. And then, you know, Bush was the face. Like he was the guy that was put in front of the cameras. Hey, look at this pretty guy. But really it was, you know, Dick Cheney run the show because he was the guy that, <clears throat> excuse me, three months before he became vice president of the country, was working at Raytheon, I believe, as the CEO. And then oh, it was, it was, it was connection to Halliburton. Or excuse maybe it was Halliburton. It was one of the major defense contractors in the country. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But they, either way, it's, it's, it's a major defense exactly, contractor. They tend to make a lot of money if there's war. Yeah. Exactly. The name doesn't really matter but the fact that he was a ceo of one of these major defense contractors three months before he became vice president 
after he becomes vice president, what happens? World Trade Center happens, you know, 9-11, and we go to fucking war. And what's pushed at us? Well, WMDs, uh, bad intel on WMDs. At some point, I think it was uh, Colin Powell or somebody of the like, like holding up a vial of something. They're talking about how it's like biological warfare and they're – so they're pushing. Uh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, it was. I think it was Colin Powell. Yeah, and and to think that guy could be bought, that guy, Colin fucking Powell. Yeah, man, that's that's some weight right there. That is some. That's a guy I I, I used to hold in a pretty high regard. Um, but anyway, um, you had a lot of convincing narrative, and, and right behind it was the American media pushing us right along with it. Uh. But after about a year, I mean, what was it? It, it was like a few months that we got the, the speech from Bush. We won. Good job, everybody. It was like a, just a handful of months, right? Or at oh, least yeah. two. Like it wasn't, I don't even think it was a year yet. It was not, a, it wasn't a full year. It was, it was a pretty then, short amount of time. Right. So then we stick around for another two decades, right? Right. Well, you have, you have, Fathers who fought when they were young on the same in the same sands walking with 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 M16s as their sons are now too. Like you have yeah. generation generations of people dying overseas for what? Generational warriors of the same battlement. It's crazy, or not battlement, but yeah, battleground. Um, I saw a chart so today that's like how long the U.S. has been at war based on like what year you're born, like what percentage of your life. I was right. born like I was born in '89. It was like almost seventy percent. Of my life where the u.s has been at war yeah i was i was 88 so i i feel you um so anyway where i was going with that is after he became vice president we went to war and then he gave billions of dollars of no bid contracts to his former company that he was ceo of now in, in case nobody understands what no bid means that means that no other company within the defense community can bid on these these are for this company to this company and only this company. Nobody else is getting it, not even a little bit. And uh, that right there, like, he got caught about that, uh, I think a few years later uh, and had to like, there, I think there was a Senate hearing about it or something. There's, it, I don't remember exactly what uh, meeting took place, but he got caught, he got charged essentially. And they're like, yo, there's gotta be some fucking accountability. So they made him, uh, I believe they made him back, pay back like a couple hundred thousand dollars. Like, no, basically chump change comparatively to what he was really making. And yeah, life. yeah. It's it's something to the effect of where, like, well, like we see it all the time where you have, um, like, 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 I can't talk tonight. Um, look at big pharmaceutical companies. Like Pfizer has paid out billions upon billions of dollars for, like, fraudulent claims, all kinds of malpractice and shady practices. But it's, it's if you have enough money, you can do it wherever you want to. Because fines, fine, fines are just... Just means it's a it, you can break the law if you're rich. Grand majority of those are are settlements with Pfizer, though. not even full trials. They're just settlements. Oh yeah, they always, they always throw money at it. They always go away. There's a bunch of money. Be quiet. Yep, that's exactly it. I mean, that's what a lot of big you know corporations. Right. Companies. Yeah, and the no bid contract thing from the government's not just exclusive to the, the defense industry. It absolutely happens on small local scale governments all the time, especially like small towns. So, um, anyway, that was, I got, we kind of moved from that, from my introduction to that. It's like, so if your listeners can't tell, I'm, I went from being eight and a half year Marine to a pretty anti-war kind of guy. Uh, I think it's necessary to be capable of violence, but I think it is absolutely the very, very last straw that must be pulled out. Diplomacy. If we want to live in a Star Trekian world, we must push diplomacy at all costs, right? Yeah, yeah. So with that perspective and, and your background there and your history of understanding some of the finer mechanics of like international diplomacy or like working with multinational agencies or multinational missions, um, I think that'd be valuable to get some of your input on you know, transitioning to what we're talking about tonight or what's been going on today. So um, I'll give a little prep. This is... Uh, February 24th. I'm going to post this later tonight. So it's all kind of as current as it can be. And um, about 15, 16 or so hours ago, um, Russia invaded the Ukraine. So 
there's I haven't polled a lot of what I was I, I work overnight, so I slept most of today. Right now it's at 6 30. We're recording this PM. So I haven't watched a lot of like the minutia of like well, what who's being hit where, what's happening. Last I really saw this morning was that um they were basically invading areas like, like land, sea, and air attacks. Missiles were flying all over the place. They're hitting military, neck airports, stuff like that. And so I'm not going to really have a whole lot of what to say about what's going on like minute to minute because a lot of information changes anyway. There's so many different sources coming in. There's so much information to digest. I don't want to talk about like minute to minute. Oh, now they're in Kiev or wherever, you know, they hit the capital. They're surrounded, whatever it is. It's more about trying to look like a big picture perspective, you know, from like what's with your perspective of like war and being more of an anti-war combat veteran, but understand there's a time and place for it. What do you think about what's what the implications of this invasion might be do you think that there may be international response in the form of boots on the ground do you think that would be justified what would the consequences of that be just kind of you know just kind of spitball i know it's a lot i just threw at you but just yeah what you got uh, so like you said it was only 16 hours ago and uh i absolutely not have had time in my personal life to, to delve into this too deeply but what little i do know is i mean we do have boots on the ground already we already have uh, and I, ver I think I verified this pretty well uh, before I came on with you today, was they have 300 U.S. advisors, ad advisors, which is special forces dudes, mm -hmm. uh, on the ground in Ukraine right now. So there's that. Um, as far as, like, conventional units, like outside of special programs dudes, um, I got a feeling they're going to want to push for it. The warmongers in uh, in Washington seem to seem to be leaning that direction. Um, I was talking to a buddy about it the other night, and we kind of both came to the same conclusion independently and, and brought it up to each other. Um, this thing about Ukraine and Russia has kind of been going on for a little while now. It's been going on for a long while, actually, but the heating up of it has been kind of stifled uh, by all media uh, outside of Ukraine, really, um, for the last, like, couple of years. But it's been kind of heating up, and especially over the last several months, I would say it's been drastically heating up even before we started paying attention uh, in the last, like, month or so. Because that's when really the world started paying attention. It was about a month ago. Right. But like, I, I would say that these tensions have been, you know, warming, warms the hot since Crimea. Yeah. But I mean, I mean, I'm not disagreeing with you, but I would say recently in the, in, in much more recent uh, months, I would say it's been obviously because of the, the uh, surrounding essentially. It's gotten hotter recently, I think. Yeah, I think both well, both their economies, Ukraine and Russia, is are having a real hard time. You know, um, with post COVID and everything like that. And I, I never thought it would be a question of if Russia invades. It's a a matter of when and how far. Like, are they going to stop at the Nipples River that runs, you know, straight through? Yeah, yeah, straight. It's a good natural barrier. And if, as like from a strategy point, it's like if I want to pull in and just sit there, like having to have a war fighting community like people other than air come across this like to fight me is going to be pretty goddamn difficult so i mean it's a smart choice right and yeah they, but like will they go that far are they just going to stay in the areas that they said were that they were uh recognizing as independent from ukraine like the the russian supporter areas you know that's how it happened in Crimea, wasn't it they they just at least said they were but there are lots of like people that wanted to join russia and then russia's like okay i recognize you as sovereign and they just jumped in yeah but from they didn't have like that many dudes like compared they exaggerated how many were supporters right but like they're saying you know and like i told you earlier like i think it was 70 the last count i saw and that was like, a couple weeks ago and i knew they were adding more there's like seven mobile battalion groups each mobile battalion group is anywhere between 1200 to 2000 people and like you know maybe only you know, 600 to 1,000 of those, depending on the group, are fighters. Then you got, you got the other, you know, several hundred uh, that are the support. But still, that's a, a lot of fucking people that can be shooting, you know. Mm -hmm. um, man, I think it's a great, great distraction. 
uh, what's going on right now with Russia and Ukraine for us, because this is going to blow up our media. Just mm-hmm. like, you know, I, I'm not, I, I don't know why our media is focused on it. That's the one thing I don't know. And I can't even really put my finger on is why they're pushing away from it. Cause I know what they're trying to distract us from. I mean, the turmoil that we have in the U S between the depreciating dollar between the COVID restrictions and uh, fear mongering of po- or fear porn that's being blasted into people every day to right. escape their neighbors and not be trustful. And now there's talk of domestic terrorism within our country um, in mass scale, like really harping on it, especially like pushing towards, uh, I mean, yeah, they try to make it political, like pushing towards political affiliates and stuff like your conservative right wing friends, you know, and it's like, yeah, you're pushing that propaganda, but then you also look at the FBI terrorism watch list and what's number three on the list, us combat veterans. So wow. they, they trusting us for a long time. Uh, at least I, that was la- I, I checked like four years ago was the last time I checked something like that. And we were still above like Al Qaeda, Taliban, ISIS. Yeah, they really don't like us, the U.S. government, which is funny because they used to employ us. Right. I wonder what if it's just you see stuff that uh, that they do, and you know how it actually works. And they're like, oh no, I can't have that get now. Right. Yeah. So it was funny. I got a bunch of buddies that were messaging me today. Uh, like one of my grunt buddies, he was like, yo. With everything popping off, I'm thinking about going back into contract. Do you want to come with me? I was like, no, nah, man, I'm, I'm good. You can go fight another man's war, but I'm not a soldier of fortune. He's yeah, like, see, that's what I was also going to ask you, too. So what have, have you gotten much of a feel for, like, what um, different communities around you feel, how, like, how their view of all this is? Like, are some people just kind of like, oh, yeah, they do want to do that soldier of fortune thing and jump back into it? Are other people are like, this is terrible? Like, what's, what's the temperature feel like? Yeah, so that's uh, the Soldier of Fortune thing is my is fortunately few and far between. So it's it's not many of my friends that are into that and looking to do that. Uh, in the I'd system. like private security contracts, stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly what they're going to do. And some of these guys are still in that business and have been in that business since they got out of the Marine Corps. Uh, and they've been doing it, you know, in Afghanistan or wherever. Um, and now this is just another another paycheck for him. So I get it. Mm-hmm. Hey, that's your choice, you know, is what it is. But then another buddy has definitely not been doing this stuff at all for the last, you know, several years since he got out of the military, but he has an outstanding resume to get into this kind of thing at the jump of a button, especially in this kind of situation. So, you know, more power to him if he wants to do it, but that's, that's outside the game for me. I have some friends um, that are terrified. A uh, buddy that called me uh, earlier, he was like, dude, have you looked at the uh, the nuclear clock? How many minutes to midnight we are? He's like, it's two minutes now. I was like, two minutes to midnight? In case nobody understands, there's a nuclear clock. And uh, the closer to midnight it is, the closer to nuclear apocalyptic destruction we are, or potential nuclear apocalyptic destruction yeah it's like a, like a doomsday clock kind of thing that doomsday. like international experts or who are good on foreign policy look at and they like gauge the threat level kind of like the right. defcon stuff like how likely is this going to happen you know so it, it hasn't been hasn't been at two I don't, I don't think since like the cold war though cold war only got to three buddy oh damn we're oh well i mean we have russia actively invading a nation that was playing with the idea of joining nato so i mean it's about as high as the cold war is going to get Let's get hotter. Ukraine's been wanting to be a part of NATO for a minute now. I feel like Ukraine's been wishy-washy about the entire thing. Because the first they'll be like, oh, it'll like treat Russia off their back. They'll be like, oh no, we're not really gonna enjoy. But then they'll be like, hey, we don't like Russia here, let's join. So they would like they walk in the fence, it seems like. That's fair. I would say that's fair. Especially since like they don't really need NATO because I mean they're they they're extremely resourceful country. Like they have bountiful resources within their country to where i mean they're cash crop of europe they, they provide can't remember i was listening to somebody that was like it was like 40 percent or 30 percent of all of europe's like fresh produce comes from ukraine wow, I, I had no idea something like that it was crazy fact check me on it i'm not exactly sure i didn't fact check myself before i said that but it sounded cool <laughs> 
Well, with all that, that ties into something else I was going to talk about too, because I know like the, the big reaction from like the international reaction to this kind of thing is always sanctions. And I, I, I'm no foreign policy expert. I'm, I'm just a guy in his room talking into a headset, but I, 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 I look at sanctions and it seems like when, they, when you impose sanctions, we're like, okay, well, this country's doing something we don't like, or the government's doing something we don't like, then we're going to say, okay, well, now we're not going to sell this product to you or, or oil or that kind of thing. When you say we, who do you mean? The United States or like these other, other places. I mean, basically, it's, it's other people you saying like that. The United States government, though, not us. I'm the United States just as much as you are. Okay, fair, fair. Yeah, yeah. On Ukraine and Russia. And right, Russia. yeah. So, so right. If the government says, if your government's not doing something we like, we're going to make the people suffer, basically. Because those, those, those fat cats in government, they're not the ones who aren't going to be able to get, get oil or fill up their cars or get, like, look at Cuba. Like, like the, the, the length they gave some of those cars, like, far past their lifespan, not able to get parts or products for it. Like, just the ingenuity is amazing. But, like, those people suffered because of sanctions. And I think that's going to make, um, potentially make Russia more bold. Like, okay, well, we're not getting resources we need. Well, then we need to invade Ukraine and take it over even more because we need the resources now. Yep, I can see that. This is just, it's just theoretical, obviously. I, you know, yeah, hypothesis, just, but I just, I just, I just, I just don't like the idea of making a country's people suffer for what their government chose to do. Because there's there's anti-war protests in Russia. I have seen that. I've seen videos of anti -pro anti-war protests in Russia, and they're, they're arresting hundreds of people, the Russian military or police or military police, whatever you want to call it. I mean, whatever whatever a government does is, <laughs> I mean, if history serves us at all, is likely going to hurt its people, whether it's intended or unintended consequences usually the latter sometimes it's very deliberate you know but i like <laughs> right the majority of the time throughout history most of the bad shit that happened was because people had good intentions but hey they didn't think about the unintended consequences either and they didn't you know balance it out so right it's a lot of times there's the short short-sightedness when it comes to like long-term policy and the effects of stuff down the road like because like oftentimes you'll be like you'll pass something to help out you know one group of people but then other ones will suffer for it things become out of equilibrium and it's just more and more and more and it just never ends right um so my mom i talked to my mom uh about ukraine and she was actually really knowledgeable about it like i my mom has opened up so much about the world uh, thank god man like this <laughs> She, she was one of those people that just had her like an ostrich head buried in the sand and was oblivious to the actual world. That was two years ago. Now this woman is like sending me articles. And <laughs> I'm like, I had a whole talk with her about Ukraine and Russia, about the mobile battalion groups that were surrounding him and the naval, uh, the Navy in the uh, Black Sea and, and the naval fleet in the Mediterranean and all that. And uh, yeah, she was telling me about it before i could tell her about it it's like holy shit that's crazy i love it <laughs> oh man yeah, it, yeah red pill mom dude I, and i never thought it would happen because <laughs> she's a she's a mature woman um but uh <laughs> you know, i didn't think i'd ever be able to change her ways uh you know because people older people have a tendency to be stuck in their ways and, but man mm. i was it gave me hope right when I needed it to keep talking to people and just encouraging them to look up things for themselves as opposed to just taking people's words for it. Yeah, and that's something I like to emphasize whenever I have conversations like this about current events or geopolitics or whatever it may be. It's like, I'm not an expert. We, we look at things, we talk about what we've seen. So like you and I usually have, like there's some there's some places we find news or information that overlap. There's other ones where, you know, you go to sources that I don't usually go to. And then usually we'll get together, talk about things where we've seen, okay, well, there's some stuff we've seen that's the same on some stuff, some stuff's different, and you get a perspective of it. And so I, I enjoy that. So I like having these conversations because it gives me a chance to be exposed to information I wouldn't normally come across on my own. So... Speaking of that, here's a theory for you. And okay. this is, you're throwing out theories. And I kind of like this one. This is one my buddy and I came up with the other night when we were talking about Ukraine and Russia. Um, we got to Afghanistan really fucking quick. About how long ago was that? Hmm. About half a year, maybe a little more. Right? Yeah. Something like that. That was, that was really about it. So we couldn't get involved directly with Ukraine and Russia if we were committed in Afghanistan, so we had to completely decommit regardless of the loss 
from Afghanistan so we could recommit, if which I think is where we're leaning, uh, to Ukraine and Russia. I could definitely see that being in the works for months. More so than I could see us just being like, oh, all of a sudden we care about Ukraine and Russia. No, I don't believe that's how this works at all with politics. I think there's a lot of stuff going behind the scenes that most people don't pay attention to, or are we able allowed, even able to see, um, that leads up to this, that builds up to this. We don't just on a whim go send 300 advisors uh, to a country willy-nilly, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, we send special forces groups all over the globe like there are certain designated regions for certain special forces groups uh as far as i believe for green beret and i'm not sure if that works the same for you know every other uh uh special forces group but i know the uh, the green berets do that but anyway um we have i mean when, when i was in we had special forces groups from all branches in very, from various branches in various places, not just in Iraq and Afghanistan, but in Pakistan, Yemen, Syria, Libya. Uh, a lot of, I had one buddy who is a Marine uh, recon who spent a lot of time in South America dealing with uh, uh, the drug cartels, which was really interesting to hear. I know a guy that would do similar, similar work there as well. Like, you told me he spent most of his time in South, in South, uh, South America. I'm like, interesting. Well, I mean, it, it made sense. Yeah. Because, I mean... Well, and we know there's those, those little proxy wars all throughout the world that the U.S. always has their fingers in. I mean, you can look at, you know, our history has always been happening. You know what's happening now, too. What is the actual purpose of Green Beret, right? Like, we'll just talk about Army Special Forces real quick. Green Beret is you can drop off 12 dudes in a country and come back a few weeks later and that motherfucker is destabilized. Like, yeah. You know what I mean? It, it's like somebody just blew over the house of cards. It's with dudes. they're they're regime change experts, exactly, and they've been doing it for what? What is it? Twenty twenty since the seventies. So what? Fifty years now. They've been they've been creating power vacuums throughout the world for fifty years, for half a century, and now we just do it under the guise of nation building. Right? Yeah. I it's that means nation building. It means it means selling a lot of weapons and a lot of oil. So that was, I, I can give you my perspective on that one uh, for Afghanistan, at least with those uh, with those meetings I sat in on. So we were doing a lot of construction. Like for example, I'll give one very specific example, but there were several different uh, examples like this, or very similar from varying amounts of money, from less, from more. But here's a good middle road one. Uh, the unit I was supporting was uh, working with uh, Afghan National uh, Army. Um, there was a base that was a transient base. So as people left the Afghan National Army training, they would come to this transient base that had, you know, little barracks and stuff for them. And then as they go out to their units across Afghanistan, they would get sent out from this base. It was like a hub. Um, because of the influx of recruits, they uh, built temporary, uh, semi-temporary housing that was six months before. It was these tents that you can erect and then you spray foam the outside and it makes it a rigid structure. And then you can plumb in stuff to it. You can uh, put electrical in there, AC, and it's, you know, solid sealed, really good to go if you maintain it. Um, and it's really easy to maintain. Six months before, we would not only paid for, but we've contracted the building of, of, of like tens of tents, like we'll say 30 tents. It may have been a, a little more, a little less, but roughly 30 tents that can hold about a squad size element. So like, you know, 12 to 16 dudes uh, a piece, right? Had AC units, had power with lights, had the AC unit was heat or cool because, you know, Afghanistan, if, where in Kabul, it was snowed like three and a half, four feet the entire time I was there. Wow. Um, yeah, surprisingly, it was crazy. Um, but, um, or it could get, you know, super freaking hot, you know, 90 plus degrees, 100 plus degrees. Um, so we are sitting in this meeting and the guy's like, yeah, you know, I want 
13 million dollars because we already gave him 13 million dollars to facilitate and then facilitated for him the building of these transient tents six months later you look outside they're covered in snow like and it's really easy to sweep to clean the the uh, snow off the roofs like they're cone shaped roofs and you just take a long stick and you just drag it down the side a couple times and all the snow just <laughs> so they didn't do that and uh, as a result, several of these were dilapidated and, and collapsed upon themselves uh, because it had been snowing for several months and, you know, they didn't take care of them. Snow so it's kind of really like, heavy. Yeah. Oh, it does. It does. Because it would get, you know, warmer after in the, uh, during the day because it would, like, snow at night and then get warm during the day and it would melt and compact and get icy and then do it again and again and oh, again. Oh, no. That sounds miserable. It made driving really hard. <laughs> anyway, um, so he's like, yo, I want $13 million to build a new barracks, but I'm this time going to build one out of brick instead of doing the tents like you guys did. And the major I was with was like, no, we're going to give you like $7 million instead. And they went back and forth about it for a little bit. And then that was that. Uh, they ended up giving them $7 million. So we're riding to the next next place. And I was, the major just happened to be sitting in my truck. And so I turned around, I look at him, I was like, hey, sir, can I ask you a question? Like a really honest, frank question. He's like, yeah, Karen, what's up? Like, we've been working with these guys for months. We got to know each other, really personable. And he, this guy, this particular officer, like, I'm not a fan of officers. Anybody that knows me in the military career knows I hate them with a passion. But this guy happened to be pretty cool. Granted, he wasn't a Marine, so maybe I thought differently about him because of that. But anyway, uh, I was like, sir, why, why did we give them $7 million for shit they didn't take care of the first time? And they're probably not going to take care of it this time. And that I, I would be surprised if even half that money goes towards even potentially like kind of fixing those. And he's like, everything you said was right, Karim. But here's the deal. Uh, I didn't go into that meeting with the option to give or not give money that day. I was given the set parameters of what I could give and what I deemed was necessary to give for the situation. I was like, wow, that kind of it kind of hit the nail on the head because it's like, just throw fucking money at it. We know 60 to 70 percent of this money is gonna go to waste like there's another situation like that with a, a dump truck to come and uh, uh remove or a garbage truck to come remove waste uh once a week on another base and it ended up the the dump or the garbage truck would only come like once a month after four or five weeks like it was coming every every week at first or every, excuse me, every, every other day at first. And then it would only do once a week. And then it was like absent for like a week and a half. And then it started just coming once a month. And it was like, what the fuck's going on here? So when we inquired about it or they inquired about it, the people I was supporting, turns out that not just the guy that we figured the contract with, but every single level all the way down to, I guess, to the driver, uh, was taking money off the top and just, you know, pocketing it. it this is all so taxpayer hard. money, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's all taxpayer money. All your money. Oh. Taxpayer. Yeah, Dude, we wasted, I mean, how else do you get a national debt that goes from $800 billion in 2001 on, like, September 10th, the day before 9-11, the day R Donald Rumsfeld said, hey, you know that $800 billion, you know, we got in debt? Well, we were also missing receipts for like $1.73 trillion or whatever the fucking number was. And Congress was like, oh, that's crazy. And then the next day, 9-11 happens and everybody forgets. And then the offices that were investigating were destroyed. Coincidence. Anyway. It's, um, it's also, I just pulled up the, the usdebtclock.org. And, oh, God. Like right now, it's just watching all the numbers. Cause it shows in real time, like these numbers increasing for the national debt, state debt. It shows all kinds of uh, defense war budgets, all great stuff. Like right now, been, we're at uh, like $30 trillion. Oh, wow. Wow, with a T. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's so many numbers here. I just, I just didn't count them out to make sure I was right. 
man. And like most people, most people don't fathom how much a trillion actually is. Like a trillion, so think about this. A billion is a thousand millions, right? Mm-hmm. That's, that's how you 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 reason you 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 know break it down segmented. A billion is a thousand millions. A trillion is a thousand billions, and we owe thirty of those. Yeah, I'm pulling up like like some like, like of those comparisons for like how to how to like, comprehend like a trillion. A um, trillion, is a million, billion, I think, is a is one. Yeah, trillion. yeah, it's it's just so much. Like there may be one trillion species on the planet. No, this isn't like a good comparison. Anyway, so that's um, kind of fun to, fun to think about because if you think that maybe this government might be incentivized to push us into an, a a new war to boost the economy, well, that's something that that if you look at like Russian history, I heard someone talking about this um, like, like a couple of weeks ago. Um, like whenever they start, like, like war has always been very profitable for, for Russia. War has always been a thing that like, rises them away from, from like when things are going bad, go to war. And then that kind of resolves a whole lot of the problems or at least pushes them to a back burner and pushes the, uh, the ball down the road, takes the can down the road, so to speak. So like Putin's doing like classic Russian uh, ruler behavior here. But we, we do the exact same thing. Yeah, we do as well. Yeah. We, we do the exact same thing. Well, I, I find it so funny, like, once I took my bias away, like I'm, I am patriotic as a motherfucker, as you can see. I love your background, yeah. And uh, yeah, my, my fucking awesome shirt. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm not a nationalist, and that's where the I feel the bias steps in when you you start just seeing the nationalism or nationalistic view of things. It's like. We gotta fucking go to fucking killers. Like, hold on, let's take a pause and use our fucking brain. I mean, even the greatest or one of the greatest leaders of my generation, General <laughs> Matt Dog. <Dogg-Hatton. laughs> that, that poster is so awesome. The patron saint of Canada. I just love like his expression and everything. But he got kind of war hungry towards the. Uh, well, he would, he had beef with Trump, right? He did, I and mean, he uh, actually was uh, retiring early. Uh, but then he got fired. Uh, he, I thought he, it, it was crazy too. When he, when he stepped down, here's the crazy thing. Like there were so many of my friends, Marines, all my Marine buddies, we have loved every single one. Not a single one of us had a negative thing ever to say about general matters because he never once gave us a reason. This man's integrity has always been stacked. His honor and his willingness to step up and, and do what's right. Not just what needs to be done, but what is right. Like there's that, uh, a lot of Marines know the, uh, the story of him relieving a junior officer that was on, uh, on, uh, on duty one night. So for people that don't know, if you're on duty, uh, at, on base, like stateside, that means you're standing a general post, uh, as an officer that makes you the officer of the day or the OOD. And so you have to sit in like the battalion head shed, which is where all the offices of all the commanding officers and the, and the other general officers, or not general officers, but other supporting officers and staff uh, are housed to support the main battalion in the, uh, the in-the-field groups. Um, so you're in there, and it's a shitty deal. You're there for 24 hours. You got to sleep there. You're stuck in a uniform the whole time. Most of the places, if you're an OOD, you're not going to be in camis. You're going to be in your service uniform of some kind, whether it be your Charlies, which is a short sleeve, or if it's the season, your Deltas. You got the long sleeve, or Bravos. Bravos, right? Yeah, Bravos. Chucks and Bravos, yeah. Yep, I remember now. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so it's your tan top with your green bottoms. And, you know, anyway, so it's a shitty deal. And I... Uh, Apparently on a Christmas Eve, he saw this young officer sitting there on duty and he was like, hey, Marine, you know, that sucks you're here. Guess what? You got a wife and kid, right? And he's like, actually, yeah, I do. They're, they're at home right now. I got a wife and a newborn son or whatever it was. And he's like, okay, well, you're relieved. Go home. And he was like, sir, I have, 
I have a duty to watch. He's like, yeah, I know. I'm standing it. Go home. It's like a guy that has that kind of, and he was, a, I believe he was a, a above a, a field grade officer at that point. I think he was a, a commanding officer at that point. But anyway, just when you hear about a guy like that, an officer like that, who is never married, has no kids, dedicated his life to the Marine Corps. He was the, the single star commanding officer on the deck in the invasion of Iraq. I mean, he was the guy that said, I am pleading with you with tears in my eyes. Don't do this. We don't want to fight. But if you fuck with me, I will destroy you all. And it's like, that's the guy that led the invasion of Iraq. Like, he didn't want to go. Whenever you listen to um, any of his lectures or you read any of his books, um, he's a, a really well-thought-out guy. He's a Southern dude. But he, he he's, understands the purpose of a military, especially a Marine Corps, that we have to be default aggressive. But you don't do it for no fucking reason. You don't right. do it create more bad guys right like be polite his, his one of his famous things be polite be professional but have a plan to kill everybody in the room mm-hmm. you know what i mean so you, yeah you can be planning to kill everybody but you're gonna go around and be nice to everybody be polite be professional that is the way you conduct yourself and then he's talking about um post-traumatic stress uh you know talking about how you got post-traumatic stress which is uh, a detriment in a lot of ways to people, but then he was talking about post-traumatic growth. And that was something that myself bef- before him, before him mentioned it, myself and a lot of my buddies had never even heard. Like I've been close to deployment health since 2000. I started going there in 2012. When I got back to my second tour and it was always PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, but never post-traumatic growth. Like, there wasn't a lot of talk about that. It was more medications. Like, that was a really big thing, was pushing medications. And a lot of, you know, any veterans you have listening to this that dealt with the VA will understand. They will push you on every single medication they can and get you on it. I hear that story from patients all the time who used to go to the VA or go there every now and then for stuff. It just seems like they're storing meds at every problem there is. Right. So, um, my thought is, going back to Mattis, going back to where his, he had an issue with Trump. He starts pulling out of Afghanistan, right? He starts making moves to pull out of Afghanistan. He's on board with it. The SecDef that was, the uh, General Mattis. Um, But I think around that time frame is when coordination for Ukraine to, with that, I could see it around that, that time frame when people start like though maybe the moves maybe that was the beginning of the chess pieces to get us in the situation we're in now i could see that kind of long game and people are like i could see how people could make the argument well how could that be by crossing administrations going from trump to to biden i mean my response to that i guess would be because it's two wings of the same bird Mm -hmm. if we ever start talking about war when it comes down to voting yeah different congressmen and whoever will bark about certain things, but when it comes down to voting, both it's a nonpartisan issue, a hundred percent. Just like yeah. the Patriot Act that turned into the Freedom Act. It's a nonpartisan issue. Taking, going to war, which makes big money for everybody in, in uh, politics. And then, uh, man, I blanked on the second one. Wah, wah. Uh, but it, 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 there's, COVID, there's, uh, there's, there's poor incentive there. There's like corrupt incentive exists there. And so, well, it, it, it's, it's always it's always people who are looking for um, ways to empower themselves, sending everyone else out to do their bidding. So they're sending like, like your your friends, your sons, your daughters go over there to go die before they can land their pockets with blood money. But so like, like that's been the case like historically so often. So when you see a situation like this, like my knee jerk reaction is is more of okay, uh, we we don't need to get involved. Like at this time, it's a border dispute in a country that's not going to have any real bearing with us. Like, like yeah, is it horrible? Absolutely. What Russia's doing is, is completely fucked up, and I don't see justification for it whatsoever. But does so, that mean we need to go send people to die there too? How many of your friends have you talked to about this? Have 
said to you, or not necessarily just friends, just people you've met, said to you, uh, yeah, we got to go help. We got to go. And when I, and like, because, and like, kind of support the idea of being the 911 force of the world. How, how many of your friends have done that? For this situation, I haven't really tested the waters yet. Cause I pretty much, I woke up and then I started um, looking at like some, some new stuff to see what's been going on since I fell asleep. I haven't really had a chance to put that out there. I kind of wanted to do this kind of with being kind of like an insulated bubble for the first like, day of this or so to get some more information of what's going on comes out. And then I wanted to see what people were saying to that information. I usually like to like to see what's the information first, then I'll start to react to it. So I have a better idea of what they're reacting to. If that makes sense. So, but I, so I haven't really seen much of it. But I do know, I do know some people who are very, um, the you United didn't, States, you the world peacekeeper. And you didn't talk to anybody about it beforehand though, like before the last 16 hours. No, 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 no. I mean, I, I posted some stuff about like, we probably shouldn't get involved with it, but I have no one really responded to it. So in me a and way my, that was negative anyway. Me and my Marine buddies, whenever this kind of stuff comes up, we always reach out to each other almost immediately and start talking up a storm. And I've talked with most, not all of them, but most of my close Marine buddies about it. And uh, for the last several months, like we've been pretty much on line with, we weren't wondering if you, they were going to invade Ukraine. It was, again, a matter of when, and how far are they going to go in? Like, how deep are they going to penetrate in the hole? Um, we've been running TDGs, uh, sorry, uh, scenarios uh, about this kind of ballpark in, like, when, you know, how much. Like, I was, I was calling during, I was like, hey, man, it's probably going to happen. To, I, I was betting on it was going to be during the Olympics. Because China is getting all the distraction going on, right? Boom. Uh -huh. This was my this was my scenario that we all played out, and I this was my version was Olympics would you be used to distract from Russia, moving more and more and more and more, and then once the spotlight comes off the Olymp or starts coming off the Olympics, boom, Russia invades, gets the spotlight off of China. China then makes moves on Taiwan. So that's what I was curious about too, thinking about this main bold in China to start making moves on Taiwan. So I think. I don't know. My, my theory, I, I was I was wrong. I, I didn't think I didn't think Ukraine or uh, Russia would invade Ukraine. I thought it was all blustering and, and been big talk and pounding of chess. But man, I was wrong on that one. And so now I'm curious. Okay, well, what's what's going to happen now? Like, is, is there going to be a push to retake the area that's been seized by Russia, or is it going to be a situation like Hermia again, where it's like, oh, okay, well, you know. It's like the situation where you don't cross the line. They step over and you draw a new one. Don't cross this line. And they step over and you draw a new one. Like, just kind of do that, you know, inevitably until they get to um, that river or some other arbitrary stopping point. I, I, I just feel, uh, and again, this is personal gut feeling, speculation, hypothetical, but, and I have nothing really hard to back this up. I think they're going to keep pushing. Uh, I think they're going to push deeper than people think. Uh, I don't think they're going to try and take the whole of Ukraine, but I definitely think they're going to push deeper than most people are speculating. I think they're going to hold or attempt to hold and capture resources, essentially. They need more resources as a country. They really do. And if this is an easy grab for them, like, yeah, maybe, like, the everybody's, Everybody on on the we'll call it the allies versus the axis in this because you know, <laughs> World War Three. It's funny, right? Uh, <clears throat> like all the Uni the European countries, yeah, they're bolstering their support in a lot of ways in in neighboring countries, and like they're really pushing a lot of uh, a lot of their militaries and and their and their personnel and so on, but they're doing being a bunch of blowhards right now. Like, nobody's willing to commit. Nobody wants to be that first guy. Everybody's kind of looking at us going, you going to do it? Like, we're, we've, the last two decades, what have we? We have been the cash cow for the two major military theaters, Iraq and Afghanistan. But yeah, we've had several mil smaller conflicts in, in Syria and Libya and, and so on. But um, the two major ones that everybody knows about, unless you've lived under Iraq, is Iraq and Afghanistan. And for the majority of those, we've been the cash cow. We have been the big contributor of not only personnel, but money and infrastructure mm. and built infrastructure. So 
everybody's not – nobody wants to jump in, in my opinion. Nobody wants to jump in ahead of us. Uh, they want to see us commit because that's a, that's a big financial toll on these smaller countries. Yeah. Right? Yeah, but, I mean, the consequences of having having two – two major nuclear powers committed in a hot war against each other. Like, obviously, no one's going to want to start dropping nukes right away, but, like, like this stuff's going to escalate. How is it going to come to a close? You have two rival superpowers battling in conventional warfare, but with, with game-over buttons on both sides of the equation. Is it, is it inevitable that if a war starts, that's going to lead to nuclear detonations, or do you think we can keep our fingers off the button for another go-around? So you want to hear my rabbit hole? Yeah. This is this is the one people are going to like, they're going to be like, all right, dude, take off the tinfoil hat. <laughs> oh, was your real crazy one real quick before you start that? I saw a clip of Alex Jones like uh, like in October last year talking about war starting in February of this year. I didn't watch the entire clip because I, I don't have that much time for all of his conspiracies right now. But like he's been writing about so much lately. And I'm like, well, what I can say, I can't tell if he just says a bunch of crazy stuff and like he throws like shotgun effect. He throws enough out there, some of it sticks. But either way, it's like The Simpsons. It's like the Simpsons. It is. It is. Like it, it, he's been right about enough stuff that I don't believe everything he says is true. I definitely don't. He was very, very wrong about Sandy Hook. But I, I said he says that enough has gotten right for me to pay attention when he talks, just to see, like, oh, he's saying. Mm, well, he was calling we'll out Epstein and at the lowly. He was talking Express. about that like a year, two years ago. Actually, twenty years ago. Oh my Hello. God! He, yeah, yeah. He was he was talking about all that. It is that that was when he in his very very early start of his career, uh, when the internet was first blossoming for us, uh, is when I I picked up on him a little bit and I was like, man, this dude's fucking nuts. And then you know, a few years later, I'm like, wait a minute, yeah, it was a little right. The what Human else? Grove is when I first I first was uh, introduced to what he was saying, and then him being like, like wait, he was right about that. Like I really like okay, if this guy who's selling like like male vitamins and stuff like that on his show, and like with that voice and that pompous kind of attitude, if he's right about about the, a bunch of elite people in the world meeting together like cult like style to, to worship oh, yeah. like, now, like yeah. the owl god and like and, like, to do like weird pagan rituals, if he's right about that, and there's people in the U.S. government he's confronting about it, they're getting real real queasy at the thought of it. Well, mm -hmm. Anything's on the table now. Yeah, absolutely. Anyway, sorry. So go to your rabbit trail conspiracy theory. Right. So if I was going to, if I was the ruler of the world, right, this is my scenario of ruler of the world and how it turns into a rabbit hole. Um, we're being distracted by back and forth, like I said earlier, Russia, China, back and forth with their ways, Olympics and war, and then war, and so on. Um, the last year russian hacker farms have been really been kicking up <clears throat> their uh their their output as i'm sure a lot of facebook messenger users have experienced getting a random message from a friend and you know it's somebody you probably haven't heard from in like you know 12 years and it's just like what the fuck is this and you click on it, it ends up being a russian i sent I, I told a buddy of mine, it happened to a buddy of mine, it happened to me several times, and now it's happened, or not several times, like twice, and then it happened to uh, several other friends of mine, well, one of my buddies, he sent me a random, whenever I get one of those random messages, I send it back to him, hey, you know, you probably hacked, and then he yeah. actually, big computer nerd, he traced it back to Russia, and he was like, it's a fucking Russian hacker farm, I was like, you serious? No like, shit. How the fuck did you, I was like, how did you do that? He's like, I'm magic, bro, I'm like, Whatever, man, it's cool. I, I every time I see any like, hacking or computer tracing stuff, I'm just, I'm so oblivious to how that actually works. I'm actually watching the Matrix. Yeah, I'm I'm in that case, in that aspect, I am technologically illiterate. Like this, <laughs> what we're doing here is about almost the extent of my technological capability. It's it's, it's stretching mine, quite honestly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so anyway, um, going into cyber warfare with the hacking and so on, I could see. The potential for uh, an attack on our infrastructure, particularly our power grid, maybe, or uh, some of the banking systems, uh, or the major banking systems, um, that would really hurt us, I think, uh, economically. Uh, but by, I mean, even the Department of Energy uh, went in front of Congress. And, 
2010, 11 or 12, somewhere in there. Uh, and it was like, hey, you know, our infrastructure, our electrical infrastructure is extremely weak. Um, we need to fix it. And for like $5 billion, we can fix or at least make it a lot, a little bit more robust of an infrastructure for the entire country for just like five or $10 billion chump change comparatively to the war effort. Mm -hmm. And Congress was like, get fucked. And they're like, yo, <laughs> in this scenario, say an EMP or a so CME, a coronal mass ejection, a major solar flare comes out of or the Or if Texas, a bad winter storm. Yeah, something of the sort. <laughs> and it affects a large portion of the power grid or the entirety of the, say it affects the entirety of the power grid. That was their scenario. It infects the entirety of the power grid of, of all of the U.S. Um, and it was only talking about the U.S., not including North Canada or, or Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, within one year, 365 days, there would be a 90% mortality rate. Just because of loss of infrastructure and people's inability to take care of themselves. That we're not designed to, for that just to go away and us be able to take care of ourselves. Like we got indoor plumbing. We're, we used to be able to go up to the faucet, turn it on, it works. It doesn't, most people, most people, not all people, but most will be like, what the fuck do I do now? Yeah. Well, I'm going to go buy some water. Well, you can do that until, you know, there's no more water in the store and then it doesn't get stocked anymore and so on. So, so if I was going to, whether it be a cyber attack, an EMP, or even a natural occurring thing like a coronal mass ejection, um, I do believe that would be likely, though. Like, honestly, like a deliberate EMP or cyber, some type of cyber attack to shut down critical infrastructure like that. Um, what happens then is not only our <clears throat> waning economy continues to destroy, get destroyed, and collapse. So now we're, we're continuing to see hyperinflation. But now people can't get to work. You can't get the food you need. You're... You can't get the water. You know, what, do you, what are the four things you need in life? Food, water, shelter, security. Not necessarily in that order, but relatively, you can go about three, four weeks without food. You can go about three days without water. You need shelter to shield yourself from the elements. You need security. And there's a lot of buddies I have, you know, talk about that kind of scenario. And they're like, oh, I got my guns. I got security. Yeah. Just you. You're going to stay awake 24 7, bro? Right. Yeah. You can't do that just by yourself. A lot of preppers don't factor in that fact, too. They're like, oh, well, I've got all this stuff, but the only thing I'll prep is a team. Right. Like, I, that's why, I, like, especially in the area that I live now, I, um, <clears throat> I build up my community. I bring up these things to them. I have these conversations with them, like, hey, dude, this is a very real thing that could happen. I, I think it's very likely to happen to us. So, anyway, going all back to the, the, rabbit, the rabbit hole. Um, say an event like that occurs and we go down into turmoil. Russia does its thing over in Ukraine and without the U.S. there to back it, well, they can pretty much go in with a lot less resistance. Um, same thing with Taiwan. Now, that's another cool thing that Ukraine and uh, or Russia and China are doing. You got Ukraine on this side, you got uh, Taiwan over here. We're not going to fight a two two edged war right now. We just won't. I don't think we do. We don't have the we have the size of a military. I think we do to do so, but I, we don't have the budget to do so. Well, I'm also curious if like cutting ties with China like that would would damage our economy too much. We're so reliant on them for resources and products and electronics and stuff like that. I wonder if that would be an incentive to to avoid war with china and china's close allies with russia we decided getting things hot with russia well china's not going to be happy about that then that risks our our uh industry. well there is Sam, there is samsung in in taiwan but if we do that we stay buddy buddy with china then we would be able to keep major industry like that so i would make well, china's got a monopoly on creating creating microchips too so new technology in the future too would be we could find whole new sources for so much of what we need for all the advancements that keep us afloat or that we sell to the rest of the world that keeps us in uh, economically viable territory. But right. there's also a bunch of factors to consider too about the petrodollar. 
And what's gonna, what's, what's happening now with banks dropping Russia from their currency all over the place? And like Russia's, right. like, they're not going to trade with dollars. They're going to go trade with whatever. Even with, with the rubles dropping, people aren't trading. So I don't, I don't know everything going on with the with the economic side of things. I'm not well versed in economics as much as I'd like to be in the first place. But like I just know that there's significant impact that's going to be occurring there. That's something for us to look out for. On so like the things I just want to kind of bring up, I guess as we're as we're closing out more, um, we're going to be things to look out for, like things that I'm going to be curious to watch as this whole situation moves forward. So I mean, we can hypothesize about this stuff all the time, but I'm just curious. I want to watch what's going to happen to the world economy and, and Russia's economy and what's going to happen with that in regards to different kinds of sanctions, because the, the, the world community is not going to be kind for this. Like so far, just the bit I saw this morning when it was still like a couple hours into the story was that, and I got to call it a story. I thought that desensitized it a little bit, like, like this, this war, this invasion, yeah, is, sure. is this active war um, is uh, so that's one thing that people aren't going to receive it well they're going to do economic and uh, and the other kinds of sanctions like that so that's going to make you the people suffer more potentially make the country more desperate to hold on to resources that Ukraine or other places may have I should be curious what happens to that trade and as it involves China and other allies of these nations that are involved with it and it's also going to be very interesting to see the internal conflict in the United States between between you know those who have actually been to war and that would be called on to do the fighting again and those who are sitting back at home and whether they're going to think about their wallets, the people, or something in between, or one and then try to sell the other. So it's, it's curious to see how the media is going to be spinning this too. I saw a story like on, on like CBC or some other news source like that, one of the major network corporations, there was a headline that said, that basically all of our uh, supply line problems and inflation and stuff like that was tied to Ukraine. What? Yeah, yeah. It was like one of those, it was, it was one of those three pages I follow. I had like a meme you know, that the um, oh, the uh, that comedy um, group of people they do like pranks and stuff. Um, I can't remember their name. They have a show that's really popular. Anyway, I'm getting off track with that. But yeah, but yeah, that was the headline from like CBC, CNBC or something like that. That's fucking nuts. Right. So it's gonna be interesting to see what everyone's saying i'm really curious to watch what like what putin says about stuff because i heard he was going after <laughs> nazis throughout the ukraine and that's justification for hitting targets within the nation outside of those like quote-unquote annex zones so it's just a lot a lot that i'm really curious what was going to happen next like what are you what are some things you're looking out for i i think we can absolutely expect to see a push from the <clears throat> the corporate media uh the mainstream media the corporate media uh a definite positive push once we decide to commit because I, I i think the warmongers in dc typically get the war they want i mean we we've seen it not only occur in our lifetime but maintain itself for the majority of our lifetimes like didn't we just say before or was it during the you know 75 percent ish of our lives we were at war yeah you know that's the hell of a thing to think about. And that's What's so, of, it's so strange too, because we, we just, we just had like, what we thought was this big moment. We're like, oh my God, that this war at the Middle East is finally over. Or at least, you know, the, the big public face of it's finally over. There was always going to be proxy war bullshit with, 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 you know, advisors going in and doing stuff all over the place. But as far as like having like, you know, the, the average American who wants to serve their country spending years of their life in a desert somewhere that has no impact on the United States anymore. That was over, we thought. But now we have a potential, you know, another war coming or occurring. Uh, I think everyone's just really scared to see what's going to happen because we have so much bad, bad blood with spilling blood on foreign soil for good reason. I'm just, I want to be very, very, very hesitant to do that, do that again. I don't want to say goodbye to friends who are going over to fight and possibly not come home from somewhere so far overseas that doesn't have a big impact, at least right now, from what I can tell, on our security at home. I, I think we should have zero involvement. Like, people are talking about, you know, we, we should do our diligence if our UN counterparts decide to get involved as far as, hey, you want, you know, resources? Or you want money? You know what? No, fuck money. You want resources? You need like some trucks, something that you guys can't manufacture. You need some bullets. Or you need some bombs. Sure. You're our buddies. You're our UN allies. We'll hook you up. But boots on the ground, conventional boots on the ground, like beyond the advisors that are on the deck, 
fuck no, dude. We have no business being over there. There's a whole continent over there to take care of that shit. What the fuck do we need to go over there for? Not a damn thing. Nothing. That is nothing but warmongering and money grabbing. That's if if to this is coming from a guy again, eight and a half years. I got a really good look at what war is. Not just from a guy that was getting shot at, watching my buddies getting blown up, but then going from that to seeing where money goes. What why are we spending 20 trillion or yeah, 20 trillion dollars in 15 years? You know what I mean? Like that, I figured out why. I fucking saw it in front of me. And I was like, man, now I understand what Smedley Butler, a retired jet Marine Corps general, was talking about. Because he went from being reti- uh, being a U.S. Marine Corps general, retiring, and became one of the biggest anti-war activists. He was like, I once suspected it, but of now I am certain. War is a racket. Nothing more. Damn. This guy was, I think he was a lieutenant general, major general, Marine Corps. Marine Corps. Like, you don't hear Marines talk like that, especially high-ranking Marines ever talk like that. Hmm. I understand where he was coming from. It was like that back then during his day. And it sure as hell even more so in our day. And I don't want to get involved with that, whether it be my friends or just my own country. I don't want to hear about my country, men and women, going to a foreign land for someone else's financial interest. Because the last big conflict that we were in, that's all I saw it to be. And I now think if we see this happen, I can relate a lot to how the Vietnam vets felt when they watched us go. Because when we come back and we talk to those guys, the VFW and shit and the American legions, they start crying in front of us. And at first like time or two, it happens to you. It's awkward as fuck. Well, it's always awkward, but it was like really fucking awkward. Cause you had no idea why it was happening. Like it was, first time i went to a vfw to go drink i was i wasn't really you know heavy into my career or anything like that didn't really have you know felt like i had a whole lot of salt to to really console a man that had been through this much but then he starts talking about us and our war and he's like man you got it worse I'm like, man, oh, you fuck you figure like you're telling me about booby traps with shit smeared on it like how how is my war worse He's like, because at least a few, every once in a while, we'd find a guy with a uniform. Nobody has uniforms for you guys. Like, you're the only ones that everybody knows is a fucking guy to kill. I'm like, damn, that's a good point. I thought about it like that. <laughs> but yeah. Anyway, I don't want to be, I don't want to sit back and watch my country go into another needless war. Because this is my country. This is your country. This is our country country and we need to start thinking of it we need to start thinking of it as we are shepherds of this country because people have lost what freedom really means it's not the right you you can you're free it's not you're free to do as you please right it's the right to do what you ought to do bears responsibilities bears duty and again i'm not talking about being like my buddies and I did and putting on a fl- uniform and a flak vest and a, a rifle and going and fighting somebody. That's a very, very, very small and it should be extremely rare event for this country. What I'm talking about is the responsibility to pay attention on the home front to ensure that politicians, because they should never be trusted, even our founders understood that, we some reason have lost that today. Like people give the government the benefit of the doubt at all times that it should, they're probably looking out for the best. And they, we got guys, that's why we elect these fucking people. Yeah, but we got to pay attention to what these assholes are doing once they're in. Mm -hmm. And then when they start fucking about, which they, and I'm not even talking about war now, but they are deliberately, it's obvious and deliberate moves to destroy this country. If you've ever read the Declaration of Independence, it makes it pretty clear what you're supposed to do in that case. And with a country full of million, two million veterans, 
combat veterans from two decades of war. Anybody that's read anything about the Peloponnesian Wars that happened in Greece can tell you how that's going to fucking turn out. Like, it's going to be a bloodbath. It would be absolutely yeah. devastating. Yeah, I mean, I was yeah, laughing like, about the history joke, but yeah, no, this is this is something that would be completely devastating. Yeah, like, I, I think I heard Joe, a buddy of mine sent me a little short clip of Joe Rogan talking about it. Uh, like, he was like, you know, think about these veterans, these, you know, million plus veterans we got in this country. He's like, what happens when, these are, like he was saying, like, these are the guys you break glass in case of war or whatever. It's like, what happens when these guys think you are attacking their country. What happens when you think these people are, these people think that you're going after their liberty, after their real freedoms, they're going to turn loose on you. It's like, man, you're not fucking wrong. I mean, we talk to veterans and guys start talking about it. And it's like, man, like, what are we going to do? Fuck, I don't know. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? I think we're gonna have rid of more conversations keep, like this. Well, I think that's man. I'll start, and so I started seeing a lot, a big push by veterans into Congress. Like, there's more SEALs pushing into Congress. Uh, I think there's a couple more, a Marine or two <laughs> that are running. Um, but like, there's, I, I see a big, big push. Like the guy that was the chief out of uh, the movie Act of Valor. It's the one military movie that was done by all the dudes that are actors in the movie are actual like Navy SEALs and shit. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I, so I like watch they're, that now. they're acting is fucking terrible, but damn it, their tactics are beautiful and that's the only thing I care about in a war movie. I could forget bad <laughs> acting if it's legit. I'll watch it. Oh, it's so bad, but it's it's so good at the same time. <laughs> act, <laughs> act of valor. I think I actually got it on my I have my DVD stack over there. I'm looking to see if I can see it from here. Uh, well, I can't. Really but anyway, good. great, great movie. Uh, I highly suggest anyone and everybody to see it. Um, if you, it, It's cheesy at times and painful to watch. But if you like a movie with good military tactics in it uh, and room clearing, this will get your dick hard. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, dude, thanks so much for coming on and talk with me, man. Like I said, there's a lot going on, and there's a lot we don't know, a lot we're not going to get right. But also, there's lots that can be it can be viewed from certain perspectives that I think are going to be important. And I think just listening to one side of an of a issue, especially when it comes to something like this, would be foolhardy. I think listening to as many people as you can, getting all the information that you can before acting on it. Like I think acting quickly and rationally or emotionally in situations like this is what's going to lead to much worse results than if we take a second, pause, if I was going on, see where the dust lands, then see what kind of vault we need to get. Because I, again, I don't, I don't want to see more people come out. I don't, I don't want to be having a podcast in 10 years from now about the mental health aspects of PTSD from war in Ukraine. Exactly. And neither do I. Well, thank you, brother, for having me. I always enjoy talking to you and hearing your perspectives because it, it does vary from mine and uh, it always is beneficial to me every time. So thank you. Appreciate you so much for what you do, what you've done, and everything you're going to do for the future, too, man. Be good. Have a good one. And everyone listening, thank you so much. Love you guys. And uh, stay tuned for more. See you next week. Bye. Rock and roll.